So I think we're starting here. Well, everyone, uh, again, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, I, I'm a very, very big fan of uh, what Yaron, of Yaron has uh, done and with the Institute. Uh, he was you know, executive director for many years. Did I get the right title there? Director, I think, right? Yeah. But executive director, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, now chairman of the board. Um, I'm super excited, as you can all hear my voice, uh, to have this gentleman uh, coming to our audience. And uh, he's. we're going to have the pleasure also, those of you that that listen to um, the Wealth Standard Radio from Patrick Donahoe at Paradigm Life, very close friend of mine. Uh, he'll be on that show and, and uh, probably talking about a little bit different topics. Uh, but I'm just extremely excited and blessed to have um, Yaron on with us today. Um, Dr. Brooke, thank you so much uh, for joining our audience. Well, my pleasure. It's, it's good meeting you. <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, you know, beforehand, we had an opportunity to talk a uh, a little bit about what our topics might be today, and uh, there are just so many that that I would love to go down the path of. I was just I was just mentioning to uh, to him off off the air here that I had, I had just read Anthem, um, and uh, I'm I, you know in um, Atlas Shrugged is by far my, my favorite book of everything out there. Um, you know, Creature from Jekyll Island and many others are just fantastic, but that one is by far my highest. Um, Anthem was just a wonderful um, addition to it. Fountainhead. Um, can, if, you know, even before the Institute, could you give uh, the audience just a couple moments of, you know, how you ended up there and, and, um, you know, I sure. didn't, uh, I think I, you know, I mentioned in the introduction a little bit about your military history, but love to hear that from your side. Sure. I mean, I, I, uh, I when I was 16, I was a, uh, I was a real committed socialist. I was a committed, um, collectivist, tribalist, I would even say, um, I was, I was completely you know, uh, ready to sacrifice myself for the, for the Israeli state. And, and, uh, and then somebody handed me a copy of Atlas Shrugged, uh, kind of out of nowhere, a friend of mine just, just handed me this book and I landed up reading it and, and fighting it and, and disagreeing with it and not wanting to accept the message of the book. And, and I remember even throwing the book against the wall and yelling at Ayn Rand. And, uh, uh this of course in my little bedroom in, uh, in Haifa, Israel, and, uh, you know, by the time I'd finished the book, that was it. I was convinced she was right. The rest of the world was wrong. Uh, it, what she was advocating, her philosophy, her ideas were right. And I had to rethink everything. I had to rethink my life. I had to rethink my values. I had to rethink my commitments. I had to rethink my virtues. I really had to rethink everything about my life. And I, and I did that. But in the meantime, you know, you're in Israel, you're a kid, and, and part of what you have to do is serve in the military. At age 18, uh, you have no choice. And uh, at age 18, I, I joined the military, um, landed up in military intelligence, and uh, served there for three years, uh, and met my wife uh, in, um, in the same, she was in the same unit as I was in military intelligence during the 1982 war in Lebanon, so I got, got to experience a little bit of what a war looks like uh, from the side of, of, uh, of at least a, an, intelligence, um, an intelligence soldier. Um, and um, so that was an interesting experience. We, we can talk about that if you want. Uh, and then uh, they went on from there to get a, uh, uh, an MBA, a, an undergraduate degree in Israel in engineering. Uh, I know you're an engineer. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a civil engineer. You, you're much more sophisticated than I am mechanical <laughs> and nuclear. I mean, that's, that's at least the title is, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, I know that I know the material you had to study to get there. So it's quite an achievement. And, um, and then, uh, decided I really, after I read Atlas Shrugged, really one of the decisions I made, one of the value decisions I made was that I wanted to live in the United States. And, and one of the first things I asked my, my wife when we were dating was, Hey, uh, I want to I want to leave Israel and move to the U.S. And she said her response was, you know, when do we leave? So I, I knew <laughs> this was going to go well. And so we landed up, so I landed up moving to the U.S. after I finished my undergraduate degree. And after she finished hers, uh, I came and got an MBA, landed up getting a Ph.D. in finance, becoming a finance professor out at Santa Clara University for seven years and then was recruited by the Ayn Rand Institute to, to become the CEO or the executive director. Uh, in uh, 2000, I uh, served in that role for 17 years. That's painful to say, it was <laughs> long, but for 17 years, I'm, I really am that old. And then um, 
have been chairman of the board since and, uh, you know, continue to speak um, speak worldwide on Ayn Rand's ideas, uh, continue to have my own uh, podcast, the Iran Book Show, uh, YouTube channel, the Iran Book Show channel, and uh, try to get her ideas to, to the widest and broadest audience possible. And, um, you know, that's, what I, that's really what I do today. Now, on, on the side, I have to add, on the side since 1998, I've also been a partner in a hedge fund. And uh, so that's where the income has come from, primarily. Uh, so uh, from 98 and, to, you know, through today, I'm, I'm a partner in a hedge fund. Okay, understood. Um, what is your hedge fund? Uh, is there a niche that it's investing in? Just out of curiosity. It is. There's a, there's a very, uh, very, uh, very niche uh, fund based on research my partner and I did when we were finance professors at Santa Clara University. So it's published research in the journal, for, in some of the top journals in finance. But uh, at some point, we were approached by a large hedge fund and asked whether we could take that research and turn it into a trading opportunity. We did that for them for 10 years and then went our, went our own way and, and created our own fund in, in uh, 2010. And, uh, and that's the fund we have today. So um, the niche is uh, small community banks. So we, okay. we basically uh, uh, buy and sell long and short small community banks. And uh, we, uh, we're very good at it um, and uh, have, done, have done well. Fascinating. <laughs> I could go so many directions with that question. No, uh, the, the challenge there. there is there's only so much I can say as well, given <laughs> yes, SEC, you know, we're heavily, heavily regulated. We could talk about that. All the regulations, <laughs> uh, anybody who does finance in any kind of institutional way has to go through and the pain and the headache that, 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 that those regulations entail. But part of it is I have to be very careful in how I speak publicly about the fund. And and uh, I, nothing I do can be construed as marketing the funds. So uh, uh, I have to. Got it. By the well, you, you don't ask me where I took my submarine. I won't ask you anymore about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to ask you where you took your submarine. Uh, <laughs> all right, now I'm curious. So <laughs> although I could probably guess, given that yeah, I, I'm sure you can, given, <laughs> given that I could probably tell you some stories about where uh, where Israeli special forces did their training and and. Yeah. Which desert they they, <laughs> they happen to be dropped into and picked up in? I mean, you could. I'm sure you know more than I do, but uh, oh boy. I can just imagine where you took your submarine. <laughs> um, and so, uh, well, I, I certainly am excited to go and uh, and listen to your podcast. I'm certainly I'm definitely a podcast junkie, um, and and I learned a lot. So I I will would push the audience that way as well. So we got a lot of people who are. Um, in uh, you know government service uniform, active duty, or our veterans, um, and some of this might you know rub them the wrong way. Some of the stuff that I say might do that, so maybe not. Maybe they've already long ago given up this show. Uh, but I also see a, a distinct parallel with um, firefighters, police officers. We all just kind of think the same, and I think it's because of the way in which we come to our job and stay with this kind of painful sometimes job and dangerous job because out of service, right? And so. One of the things that as I started to transition from kind of, even even as an officer, you know, you're a follower for a period. Of, you're always following someone, right? There's always someone above you, but you kind of become this decision maker and leader. And certainly when you have command, uh, you have the opportunity to the, the true blessing to, to have command at some point, you're a leader on your own making the kind of the final decision sometimes. Um, but but nonetheless, I've I've kind of felt like there's two things that you make a decision about when you're in the military and or in, in a position of service, public servant. One is just the pure ideal of serving others and serving your fellow man and um, those that, you know, protecting those that you love. And I think that's a very easy, easy decision. And I think at just about every level, that's honorable. Um, and then you get to a point where do you want to lead and further the political ideals of your country? And that's a completely different discussion, right? Um, you know, and so one of the, I guess one of the things I would say is, um, we all have to make that decision as we go through life. Yeah. And, and I believe that everyone who decides to join is taking on the risk of, um, you know, of putting themselves at risk to serve others that, that they love and believe in. And some of it, sometimes it's ideals as well, but, um, you know, I think bottom line, I'm very proud of everyone who serves. I'm sure you are as well. Right. Uh, but, I mean, but sometimes yeah, eventually it's hard on you. I think why people serve is important. I think the motivation yeah. for why they serve is important. And I, I think too many people get caught up in, in a couple of, a couple of things. One is, um, you know, to get caught up too much in the 
service for the sake of service, right? So, yeah. so, so I'm going to challenge you here a little bit. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, your highest moral responsibility, in my view, as an individual is to live, to live a good life, to, to make the most of the one life you have on this planet and, and, and to, to really, to really uh, flourish and to, to follow the values that, that, that are going to make you the best human being you can be. Um, for some people, that involves... Um, uh, you know, the kind of dangerous activities that, that, that the military engages, the firefighter engages in, in, in um, and, uh, and others engage in. But for others, it doesn't. For others, yeah. it involves a, a different path. And I, and I don't think any particular path is more honorable than the other path. It really depends on your values as an individual. I, I also think that a lot of people go into the military for the wrong reasons. Mm. Uh, they go into the military because they think it's going to be cool to shoot big guns. They go in, and, and I don't think there are many like that, but I think there's some. They go into the military because they think that their highest moral duty, duty is to serve their country. It's to serve a goal bigger than themselves. Uh, okay. I don't think that's good. I don't think that's <laughs> good. I don't think there is a goal in the end, at the end of the day, bigger than you, right? Yeah. I think you are the highest goal. Now, that doesn't mean... You don't risk your life sometimes for the sake of people you love, for the sake of people you care for, ideas that you think are incredibly valuable, uh, that, that are necessary for human survival. But I think that if your goal is the nation, the state, the, you know, that's probably not good, right? That's not good. That's, that, that's problematic. So I, I think yeah. a lot of our, even our terminology, when we talk about this, when we talk about service, when we talk about what that means, is tricky because that service could be motivated by what Ayn Rand called altruism, what the culture calls altruism, which is, you know, the self self negation and the, the willingness to sacrifice for something outside some, whether it's mystical or whether it's collectivistic or something like that, or service can just mean in pursuit of one's own values. And those values certainly include other people. So you're, you're serving other people but not as a contradiction to your values, not for something greater than yourself, but for yourself. Yeah. Because it's in your self-interest to serve others, because service to others uh, uh, supports your values in, in, in your life. You know, there's a lot of people, obviously, during Ayn Rand's life, there were a lot of people that were very outspoken against this idea of, you know, of uh, objectivist, or not so much that, but also uh, serving your own needs in that it was selfish, right? And 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 selfish. The, she believes that selfishness has a purity, and yeah, that really came out in answer. Term selfish, right? She embraced yeah. it from selfish, yeah. and said selfish means taking care of self. Simple definition: selfish yeah. means taking care of self. And then the question is, and she says, this is the question of morality. This is the question that ethics must solve. The science of ethics has to solve this question: What does it mean to take care of yourself? What are the actions you must take? What are the values you must pursue to take care of yourself in the deepest, most meaningful, most substantial way? Not in the superficial way of, I need food, I, you know, I'm, right. I, need, I need some money or whatever. But in the deep spiritual and material way, what are the things that you must value in order to take care of yourself? So she embraced the idea of selfishness when it meant the values and virtues that truly, objectively, based on reality and the nature of man, truly make us happy, successful individual human beings. And it's not easy to figure out what those are. <laughs> I was going to say, you so want to just listen to us? <laughs> one of us as individuals. Yeah. This is why we need philosophical guidance. This is why having a philosophy, having a way of thinking about the world is so crucial. And, and, and what Ayn Rand does is she gives us a a map, a, a guide to living our lives, to, 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 to going out there and executing on living the best selfish life possible, uh, pursuing the right kind of values and, and the right kind of virtues. Yeah. And, and I think th it would be unreasonable to believe that every person who enters military, for example, or service to others would uh, would stay aligned perfectly forever, just like anyone who starts working at Procter & Gamble is not going to stay aligned with the company forever. There's a period of time where their personal interests are being served. Maybe maybe that's, you know, growing their family because that's important to them selfishly again, right? That's, that's, you know, part of their philosophy is to raise other, you know, beings and impart on them, you know, give them a good opportunity to grow. So, so the company pays them or the military pays them, but there's a point 
where things are not going to be perfectly aligned. And then you have to, I believe, um, I mean, I, I'd love to hear your side, but that's when having the philosophy, understanding what's truly important to you gives you the the signal of, hey, it's time for me to move on. Yes, I, I definitely think that's 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 correct. That you, you know, once you have, if you have a, a clear set of values, if you know what you believe is good for you, what you know where you want to take your life, then uh, you know at a regular intervals, one should evaluate one's own life to figure out, am I on the right path? And and what Rand teaches us is the guide to determining all that is to is using our reason, is using our rational faculties, thinking is taking in all the evidence that we have, plotting out where we want to go and, and figuring out what the right path is, figuring out rationally, not going based on our emotions, not going on based on what our mother wants or what the group wants or what our friends wants, but or what our family wants, but really figuring out what is the right course for me to take at this point in my life and based on, on, on one's values. And I think one should do that on a regular basis. I think I, I often say that one of the, advantages of kind of the holiday season, you know, between Christmas and New Year is to really take some time off and to really think about, okay, what do I want to do next year? What, what, what do, am I on the right path? And if I am, great, then I just continue. But can I tweak it? Or, or do I want to make dramatic changes? Is this the right direction? You know, I, I, every day you live, you, you're never going to get back, right? Every moment you live, you're never going to get back. This is a, a one journey. It's one directional. And uh, taking full advantage of it is what I think the, the real challenge in life is. is and, and figuring out how to do that is not easy. Yeah, that, that is absolutely true. And, and I completely agree with you on, on that week. That's just an amazing period of time at the end of a year, the beginning of the next year. It just kind of gets your intellectual juices flowing, I guess. I yep. mean, it's when, it's when I picked up uh, Anthem and read it. I mean, it's just a I'm glad that that Anthem was not my first book that I read from Ayn Rand because that one can be a bit like in your face. And uh, I, I remember I, I loved her comments that, uh, you know, about the history of publishing it. And, the, you know, the first American publisher sent back a note that says the author does not understand socialism. And uh, and holy cow, I can see, you know, if you were not open minded, um, this one, that one is a bit in your face. But. But, you know, Atlas Shrugs, w such a wonderful weaving of a novel and messages. Uh, and and yeah. I love your story about, you know, reading it at age 16. Wish yeah, I had everybody should read the book. It's, it's one of those books that's it's an American classic. Every American should read it. And that and The Fountainhead are two books that I think yeah. every college student, every 20 year old, in, in your case, maybe a little even older, uh, you know, everybody should should read it because it is whether you agree with it or not at the end of the day. It's going to challenge you. It's going to push you. It's going to force yeah. you to better understand your own values and your own perspective on life and to, and to, and to really make sure that, that kind of you know what you're doing with your life. And nothing is more important than that. Nothing is more important than really that self-reflection and figuring out, is, is this the right direction? Am I pursuing the right values? What should be my values? And really focusing on what is good for me. You know, again, we, we live... We, we spend 90, 100 years, maybe if you're younger, 120 years on this planet, hopefully if biomedicine continues at the pace it's going, um, figuring out how to make the most of it. That, that's the bottom line. How to, you know, to, 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 to steal something from the army, you know, how to be the best that you can be, right? How to really be the best that you can be at, at living, not in any particular profession, but just at living. And uh, I think Atlas Shrug pushes you in that direction and challenges you to really think that through. Yeah, and there's a lot of other great messages in there about no entitlements and everyone. Well, that, there's a political message that is <laughs> yeah. by that, right? Because if we take personal responsibility for ourselves, if our life is the most important thing to us and, and, we, and, and the people we love, right, the people around us, because we love them, are crucially important to our life, then what kind of world do we want to live in? If we have the capacity to understand the world, if we have the capacity to live our world, if we have the capacity to, to make the best of our life, what kind of political world do we want to live in? Well, every individual like that who, who, who is striving to make their life the best life that it can be wants to be free. Right. Right? You want to be able to make decisions for yourself. You don't want mother government sitting on your shoulder. To, oh, don't eat that. Don't drink that. Don't start that business. Don't pay your employees that much. 
you know, you want to be free to make decisions for yourself. And that's capitalism. Capitalism, all it is, is a system of freedom. It's a system that leaves individuals free to make decisions about their life for themselves. And as long as you're not hurting somebody else, as long as you're not violating other people's rights, as long as you're pursuing your values rationally, free of coercion, you should be left alone. It's nobody's business. And that's the bottom line of, the, of, of Ayn Rand's politics. It's freedom. Yeah, Ron, do you think we're making progress? Do you think uh, we are getting to a, a permanent, peaceful world out there? It's been a while since World War II, you know, and there's little conflicts around the world. But what do you think? Or is, it, is it catching on? Is the Internet and informa- freedom of information and all that, are we helping? So it's definitely catching on. It, there's no question it's catching on. But it's catching on slowly, and it's catching on among individuals. I wouldn't say that it's catching on to a point where it's having pol- big political impacts. Now, I think Ayn Rand's already had political impacts. I, I don't think Ronald Reagan could have been elected if not for Atlas Shrugged and Ayn Rand. I, I, I don't think that the world would have moved so far towards freedom and liberty. And if you look around the world, we've moved a long way towards freedom, not in the United States, the rest of the world, um, without kind of the, the guiding light of an Ayn Rand and, and, and the spirit that is projected in Atlas Shrugged. I think we're losing the battle in the United States. Uh, I, I think we're moving towards more statism, more authoritarianism, um, more collectivism, more tribalism, uh, less reason, more emotion. So I think we're losing the battle. But even in the US, more people are reading our books, more people engage in the ideas, more people are interested than ever before. It's just we're not big enough to have an impact yet on the culture, on the broader culture. I think we will. I think in the end we will win. The end might be decades in our future, but in the end we will. I do think in a broader sense, you mentioned the world being peaceful. I I do think the world is more peaceful. I think in the broader sense, the ideas of the enlightenment, the ideas that view individual human life as a value, as the prime value, those ideas really dominate the world out there in, in, in profound ways, not at a deep level, not as far as I would like them to go. You know, 50 years ago, if you traveled around the world and asked people, well, let's, let's start with 300 years ago. 300 years ago, if you'd asked anywhere in the world, who does your life belong to? People would have said the king, the state, the country, the nation, the tribe. Nobody would have conceived of the idea that your life belongs to you. 50 years ago, in the West, everybody would have said, oh, my life belongs to me. Even in, in, in Europe, people say, my life belongs to me. They have a misconception of what that actually means politically, but they identify their own life as, as, a, as, as a crucial value today. But, but if you'd gone then to, to the Soviet Union or, or to China or to much of Asia, they would have said, my life belongs to the party, to right. the state. To, today, if you go to China and ask people, who does your life belong to? They will say me. Wow, go seriously. To Vietnam and ask people, wow. who does your life belong to? They would say me. If you go to Russia, and you ask them, who does your life belong to? They will say me. They, again, they don't fully understand what that means. They don't fully understand the political implications of that. They don't fully understand what freedom implies. But they get the fundamental notion of the sanctity of their own life. And now we have to work on, okay, where do you take that? How, what yeah. does that mean? And, and that's true everywhere, almost everywhere in the world. There is the, the entrenched collectivism, that idea that your life belongs to this other entity, that has been rooted out to a large extent. Now, unfortunately, it's coming back. And, you know, like in the United States, there's, there's trends towards collectivism and so on. But, but it's nowhere near what it was even 50 years ago. And it's certainly nowhere near where it was 300 years ago. So the Enlightenment has changed that. It's fundamentally changed that. And then if you go, you know, think that there's more people free today than ever in human history. Free to make their own decisions about work about marriage, about the life, uh, politics. We still got a, well, a way to go in places like China, but, but certainly in China, people are a thousand, you know, so much more free than they were, you know, when they were real communists, uh, you know, 50 years ago. Um, you know, with the exception of Iran and, and, and North Korea and, and Venezuela and maybe Cuba, you know, people are, people are, freer than they used to be in, in significant ways. So, so there's definitely been a movement towards, towards that, which I think is, is quite positive. Uh, the world keeps getting richer. We keep getting, uh, we keep getting fancier technologies. We, we, you know, life is, becomes easier from a material perspective. But 
there are big challenges in front of us, particularly, I think, in the West. There are big challenges. There are real, there's real opposition to our way of life, and, and we're going to have to fight for this. this is the, we're not going to be able to preserve what we have and keep expanding the realm of freedom without a real fight on our hands. You know, and I believe uh, this is probably a stretch, but <laughs> my opinion is that um, as long as information remains uh, available, that people can read things like Ayn Rand, they can they can read works other than what's just in the newspaper, right? Then then um, we have the ability to personally think and the freedom to make our own kind of decisions and speak, freedom of speech and of being able to read. I think we have a fighting chance. Absolutely. Uh, this is why freedom of speech is probably the most important issue of our time. Uh, that availability of information is probably the most important issue of our time. Because once you freedom of speech goes, then the only means for change is, is, is war, right? The only yeah. means to change is revolution, armed revolution. I, I don't, I, I'd rather have an intellectual revolution than an armed revolution. We both know that battle is, that, that war is, is, is a very, very nasty business. It's a very, very, very unpleasant business. Sometimes you have to do it, but you, you, you never want to be an advocate for it uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. So I would much rather we, we win this uh, at the intellectual front, but once you lose free speech, there's nothing left. But I agree with you, as long as ideas can keep circulating, and this is what I'm seeing outside the U.S., what I'm seeing outside the U.S. is Ayn Rand over the last 20 years has been translated into almost every language on the planet, right? She's in Chinese. She's in Vietnamese. She's in Mongolian. She's in every Eastern European language. And what you're seeing is a rise in interest in Ayn Rand in all these countries, every single one of these countries. You're seeing a dramatic rise in interest in Ayn Rand's ideas, whereas in the United States, it's kind of flat. Everywhere else, it's, it's, it's exploding. And that, I think, is going to be the continued trend. I think that I, I don't know where the revolution is going to happen. I don't know who, you know, from what country, the, the next genius philosopher, the next genius economist, the next genius promoter of ideas is going to come from. We live in a very international world. One of my fears about, you know, the, 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 this attack on immigration and attack on trade is you know, a fear that we become isolationist, you know, that we, we right. drop the global perspective that I think is so beneficial to America and so beneficial to the world. This idea that ideas can come from anywhere, innovation can come from anywhere, that, that, that uh, you know, interacting with people across the world doesn't mean all cultures are equal. They're not. Some cultures are much better than others. We happen to have the best. Um, it, you know, we should be proud of that. We should be advocating for that. But it does mean that there's value everywhere in the world and we should recognize that and we don't know where the next great idea is going to uh, is going to come from so i so I'm, I'm inspired by the fact that the internet has no borders and and is has this international global reach and that people all over the world are being inspired by these ideas and are making their lives better and by making their own lives better they're making the world around them better as well and thus making the world for us better yeah, I, this is not a, a, a comment about objectivism or individualism. It it is uh, is simply uh, because it's a, it's a comment about social um, s social pressure, right? And I believe that social pressure uh, is having a good impact, whether that's where we really want people to go or not. Meaning that people are being held accountable because everything they do is visual or is visible. It's being recorded. It, you know, it's not private anymore. You can't beat your spouse in private anymore and get away with it, right? And you can't be North Korea and think that that you can just lie to the, your country and that no one's ever going to figure it out, right? It's just not reasonable anymore. And I believe that's getting us towards a much better world, a much more peaceful world. I, I mean, I think that's right. I, you know, I worry about uh, what is it in China now? They have a social score. They yeah, have technology to monitor all of your behavior, everything you do online, offline. They've got cameras with facial recognition and they track yeah. you where you go. And then you get a score. And based on that social score, how well you've behaved based on the criteria of the of the ruling sure. body that you, you get a loan or you don't get a loan. You start a business or you can't start a business and so on. That's scary. So technology can be flipped and used against us. Yeah, for the most part, I agree with you. Technology is 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 enabling um, enabling us to, to have a freer, better, more peaceful, uh, more individualistic world uh, out there. And, and I hope and I believe that that trend will continue. And what we need to do is fight and, 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 and ennoble the people in China to fight that trend. So 
I'm hoping yeah. to be in Shanghai later this year to, to, to talk against it. We'll, we'll see what happens. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, uh, Yaron Brook, this has been amazing. We have uh, just scratched the surface on a dozen topics that I want to cover, but I probably led you down a bunch of rabbit holes. Is there anything that a message you absolutely wanted to get out to this audience that, that I didn't ask? <laughs> Well, I, I think the bottom line is, you, you know, it's something we've said we've said already. I mean, your life is yours. It's your responsibility, moral responsibility, to take the best care that you can of your life. Make the most of it. Live the best life that you can be doing. And that means in every realm. That means in the financial realm, take, take responsibility over your own finances and figure out and have a plan and figure out what, what you want to do. It means philosophically figure out what your values are, what your virtues are, what kind of life you want to live in a, in a, in the spiritual dimension, if you will, it means politically figure out in, in politics, you know, what kind of environment, what kind of world you think will, will, will benefit you the most, will, will give you the most opportunities. I happen to think that's capitalism and that's freedom, but you have to come to those decisions uh, for yourself. So, you know, and it means at the end of the day, cherish your mind, use your mind, think, think about, Every issue you face in life, don't be tempted by emotions. Don't be tempted by what other people think. Don't be tempted by what leaders tell you. Um, you have to figure it out for yourself. And no matter what profession you are, at the end of the day, you're responsible for your own actions. Even in the military, at the end of the day, you're responsible for your own actions. You're responsible for the orders you follow. You're responsible for who you challenge and who you don't. You're responsible for staying or not staying. Right. So, so, so always challenge at least in your head always challenge the assumptions that you grew up with always challenge the ideas that surround you make your philosophy your own i think that's the real message of ayn rand make it your own make your ideas your own ideas not just something you absorbed from those around you check your premise yeah always check your premise awesome thank you so much around for spending time with our audience uh, can't wait to remain connected and learn a ton more from you and to see what happens in china with you <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yes, if you follow me on my on my show, the Iran Book Show, uh, I will be reporting on all my international adventures. Thank you, sir. Take care. You too. So, Yaron, he'll, he'll cut it off there. Uh, I, I do have to run, and I know you do as well. I greatly, greatly appreciated it, and um, I'm going to continue personally connected um, with the Institute. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Wonderful. Anytime. Thanks. Bye, Patrick. Bye-bye.